Yeah, I talk about the ELISA project and I changed a little bit from the naming. Normally it says enabling Linux in safety application. And I understrike this with open source this time because uh, I want to include also the other projects like we just had Stefano in for the Xen part and we have the Fire project. And as I have a tendency to forget it at the to say it at the end, I start with saying we also have Swag around. So if you want to get some little things later on or so, should be something in the back. Um, other than this, I gave an overview about the Lisa project several times during the last years. And this time, it's just a very short one to just get people on board on some topics to see what challenges are. And I really hope for interaction that we get into discussion and talk, which should also mean that it's not you only asking questions and letting me answer, but also that you can give a statement or you give a question and someone else who has the view can give the answer. And we have Min in the back and she's very helpful with sharing then the microphone so that we can move things on. It's very important that everybody speaks in the microphone because we have the virtual audience. Unfortunately, we cannot take the questions from the virtual audience. Maybe there's a technical solution. I didn't look at it before. But now let's look into uh, the actual session. So what we talk about here is open source projects working with our functional safety and here's that fire. They have their own summit here, so we don't have too much from them today in here. But um, then we had the Xen part. So Stefan was giving good overview. So I've just a single slide on this basically. And what you may have seen on the embedded open source summit opening keynote from Cage, he said that there's Yocto involvement in because you can build basically all the three projects also in Yocto. And we need a lot of other tooling as well. So Yocto specifically is not touching the safety element as a project, but it's a nice way to integrate, creating as bombs, getting support and so on. Yeah, so my first thing about the Zephyr project, um, what's very nice is that it's kind of a designed Artus and it brings a certification part from the beginning. They are creating safety manuals and so on over time. What's important to see it's for premium members. So it's because as you may know, safety certification is typically very expensive and you need to find a way to finance it. And here it's done by the premium members which get full availability to see all the documentation. Still the source code which is generated and the material testing and so on in the Xen project is available to everybody. It's basically, you get the things, you get your tools, but you just don't get all the full details, what you need to know how to s safely operate them to get the manual around. This is for the premium members. Uh, and this was a little bit closed over some time and now they open much more. So every Tuesday or uh, afternoon in European time, morning time, West Coast, there is a work group meeting uh, where they discuss about like safety requirements, requirements tooling, they use strict docs for creating their requirements, parts, traceability, and yeah, this was basically on the processes. Recently, they also came up to discuss about the actual requirements which they put to the system or to the death fire. This is another work group meeting. If you're on the mailing list, if you go to the Tuesday meeting, you will get forward to the other meeting as well. I guess it's on Thursdays or Fridays, but that's going on. Uh, what makes death fire sometimes a bit hard to get forward with safety is that there's a lot of sensor people in there or some chip producers, or SOC vendors, and so on. And a lot of focus is on small devices, on IoT. And even if it's on real time, it's not necessarily on functional safety for the loss of human life or risk of human life loss. So therefore, to encourage the community to follow all these proces processes, write down the requirements properly, so that's not easy. That's why you need additional resources, engineers, and yeah. You have all these non heavy non safety use cases. Uh, what's really cool about it is you have a smaller footprint, of course, from the size of the system compared to a Linux system, and you still get a strong ecosystem with a lot of contributors. I mean, you see it, they have their own track and it's full, and there are many people in there, so they're stealing also here and there other audience because it's such a fancy thing. Many contributors are in, so that's, that's quite cool. And the POSIX compatibility is may or may not be important for one or the other. Uh, yeah. For then, I, a bunch of you have been in the last one. I saw, I see a few new people uh, coming around. So 
Xen and security, as well as Tabished. They had the security working group already since 2010. Uh, there's like isolation as top priority and you can see already from the whole environment of Xen, they are much more focused on security, industrial grade, um, critical operations, and that's what they have. So they have the really rigorous quality process with strong traceability, commit traceability, since the first commit, double testation pipelines. Uh, and it's really in use also in critical infrastructures, data centers, and so So it's real something there. And compared to the Zephyr project, where it was the premium member AMD with their hardware is on the safety certification path. So in case you want to make use, Still, we have the open source version of it, the software stack. This is all there, but the manuals, the testing part, the results which you may need to get a safety certified product are under commercial conditions with AMD timeline to be seen. I think that's more hidden behind the scenes. And also here, um, so there's I think I'm not completely right with the phase one, phase two, but they keep some part open. They show that the concept is there because it's very important also to get customers to show, does it really work? So is, is by principle feasible, and that's also what we saw in the previous, previous presentation, what are elements? Is there a proper way of convincing people to say, yes, I believe in the topic, and um, then do the final assessment afterwards to really come to the safety certification, right? The Lisa project is actually a little bit different in the way of approaching the things. We get often addressed by people asking, when will you deliver a safe Linux? And we're not delivering a safe Linux. We let this do other people. We help these integrators, system creators, integrate whoever's in there, major people. And we have these as members. So we have our Red Hat and SUSE, Canonical, Wind River, Electrobit, who also provide automotive parts. Uh, I'm coming from Bosch, so we're also in. So there's a lot of people who build actual Linux systems, know how to create safe system Linux parts, and need just the support and bring in work packages and artifacts. Yeah. What's very nice is the reproducible system which we are targeting, because what we learned is when many people come in and out of the community, they bring different background. So we are working on a step-by-step -step guide. It's continuously maturing, and this is where you really have a CI pipeline, which starts from documentation up to testing, and you can see whenever something breaks in this flow of the pipeline, um, we get an error, and you can hook in at every step. So you can say, I do it from scratch from the documentation. I take a Docker image. I use cached binaries. I download the image to start debugging, and so you have many entry points for these kind of things, basically to show here's something to test your environment, your safety potential, safety application, and so on. And it's all then about elements, processes, tools, and documentation. We see this a little bit later. Well, when you look for Linux in principle, or I just did a quick grab in the net to check what kind of results do you find when you look for safety. So you can see there are many and people and companies involved. So we have uh, Intel Mobile Eye, which is now Mobile Eye standalone again, which bringing really safety into devices. Or you find reports how this relates to the IC six fifteen oh eight. Yeah, Red Hat, Elisa, Canonical, Manus, Electric, Amlix is also for safety. Ty they all give the other, one or the other way. And talking about safe Linux, safety Linux. Uh, sometimes confusing. It's actually just a QM Linux with enhanced feature sets. It's not really, even if they claim it's safe, it doesn't mean that it's really a safety Linux. But like the Lisa title says, it's enable Linux in safety applications. So you can also give this kind of argumentation that you have responsibility and higher responsibility for Linux. But this on this, um, for completeness, yes, Elisa is the prominent example of these days where the community meets before we had the Silto Linux MP project. And uh, basically this stopped 2019 and a lot of people from them brought in their knowledge into ELISA and we are progressing since then quite well. Right, the ELISA project goals are, yeah, we check on the certification of Linux-based system with these things I just met with elements, process, tools. It's more of the enablement and we want to see that the work gets accepted by open source community so that when we do updates on documentation, 
Uh, we have some workload tracing, upstreaming done by Shua. She, we're, doing this in the, we're doing this in the medical devices of Yolinda. And they figured out, well, if you do analysis, you need to understand what's running on my system. How is it work? How are those things triggered? So they used uh, tracing tools to just check, like standard Linux tools. And then we say, oh, it's important how to read them, how to use them, what does that mean? And by this, there was documentation upstreaming into the admin guide. And we also considered to put more things under the admin guide. One thing which is under preparation since a longer time and slowed a little bit down is on the preempt RT parts. Because when you talk to people, they say, yeah, it's nice that we have all these things about preempt RT in into the kernel. Uh, but you can do so much wrong when you have the wrong configuration. You may have non-working scheduling anymore, which worked always fine, but then you set wrong priorities. You don't know what to do. So how to configure all these features? This is something which we're drafting and which we plan to get somehow also then into the admin guide of the Linux kernel, because this is still a quite small area within the kernel. So there's a lot of space to fill. This we also discuss with the kernel community and uh, yeah, standardization bodies is also that we get awareness with them, uh, present, for example, at Exceder or talk to UL and uh, have members from TUF involved. So this is somewhere where we at least also try to train. And uh, yeah, then the reference systems. The systems is a point. This is, uh, if you have seen previous presentation, I love to mention this one. Uh, because a setting where the system, system is safe means you need to understand the system sufficiently. I'm, I'm saying this because I have interested people in safe Linux which come and say, oh, I want to build my safe Linux product. So, okay, what's your industry? They named the industry said, what experience do you bring? Are you an expert in Linux? Oh, no, well, we haven't done that much with Linux yet. Okay, but you're a safety expert. No, we're not a safety expert. So, okay, you're not an expert in safety, not an expert in Linux, but you want to build a safe Linux product. Good luck, but I don't do it. You don't get full support from me. Come in, learn from the others, but you don't get a provision. Better go to someone who knows what it is and uh, get it from there. And why it's like this, you need to understand the Linux part and also the system context. What is left and right? What are the microcontrollers? What are interfaces? Do you have shared resources? What is the operation? What is your use case in there? And when you look into this, how it's in their system, you will figure out, okay, Linux has a lot of components, features, and so on. And these need to be evaluated all for safety and you know, what is safety relevant, what is not safety relevant. Do I keep it in? Do I throw something out? Maybe all considerations which you anyway have when you build a product, but now you add the safety setup part of it. And then you look at it and say, well, this was not written for safety. So therefore, you will definitely identify gaps which are in there because Linux differs from a traditional safety critical operating system. The safety critical operating system is certified, very small, microkernel, as least thing in as possible, fit for purpose, no configuration. So, you know, if you just set it up and in your mind and change, like what do you see with Linux? You have a very flexible, configurable ecosystem running on different kind of hardware with same resources are uh, your live images of things. If you just plug it in a USB stick, boot a system, you can boot it on ballers every single PC which you can find. This doesn't work for safety. I mean, safety image typically is made like this that you do not even require an update because it's bug free and you just do it once and you're done. And so you can see this is a compromise. But also, then you would say, oh, let's go with the traditional approach. Don't mess up with all these Linux things uh, or other open source parts. But then you miss a strong ecosystem support because you need to port this commercial OS from one chip to another, to another, to another. You miss libraries, you miss configurations, you have to develop, you don't want to, you need to get into market at some point of time. And this complexity grows and grows with the computation performance which we have. So you may figure out that the commercial artist which you're using does not even bring half or more of the performance of the Linux kernel. So you may do your pre-development, say, oh, let's try out if things work. Okay, this works quite well, so I can use my use case. I port it to a commercial artist and figure out, oh, this was certified many years back when all these features were not there. Suddenly your caches behave differently, your uh, memory sizes are, the block size of memory are different, and all these kind of things can have significant performance impact. And then you say, okay, how do I get this forward? And will I now pay the company for all the things that they sell the solutions to many others, or may I invest in open source and getting this path forward? That's where a lot of our members also think about. And then they come to the limitations of it. Uh, whatever we do in there still, we cannot guarantee that the system is safe. So that's out. 
And our, we can also ensure that whenever you build something that you really know how to apply these things and that how to run it. And you also cannot, we cannot create an out of tree module on the next kernel tree because, I mean, there's a continuous improvement, there's a continuous involvement. And in the past, you would normally certify on a fixed version. And this is true for all the other open source projects as well. Um, we're running, we improve, we're getting better, we're adding support, and this is basically the thing why you use all this. You get all the benefits. And a typical safety certification would say, you are now at this point, please do not update anymore because with any update you need to have a change impact on all of this and then go to a recertification. And this is something which is heavily touched by, yeah, like Red Hat, Coating, I missed them in the list before. Uh, these are companies which deal with the idea, how do we update this thing, the Zephyr project, Zen project, they need to have something in mind how to update. And you will have to need something in mind to update because if you think about Cyber Resilience Act, which is an EU, uh, radio equipment directives, you have connected devices, they may be mandates to say, whenever there's a security fix, you have this amount of time, let's say, maybe if it's a long time, you would have to have it in a few days or so typically, but I think the EU, the EU says something about three months or so, but if you create safety critical systems, you know three months for recertification can already be very tricky. So you need to address this also with the commercial parts. And this is what our members do. So we have a bunch of different premium general members from with Boeing as one from aerospace, but a lot of uh, automotive parts as well. We figure out that it doesn't matter that much which safety standards you are because the requirements are very similar. So we can create a bunch of blocks with artifacts and activities. And there is a set of more generic parts. So this is the working group structure with open source engineering processes, safety architecture, features in there, they all interoperate. We create a system out of it. We use tools to check things in there like a requirements tool or a visualization tool for kernel trees uh, and so on. But a system, you may hear safety element out of context quite often, but there is never really an element out of context. That's the name which they put in but it's always in an assumed context. So you make assumption and these people who create a safety element make assumptions. They say this is the way how you should use it with their use cases in mind, which they had, and that's what they call the safety manual. So you need to comply on it, to it. And that is quite complex. You will see if you, yeah, I guess most of you will maybe run on ARM hardware. You could also be on x86, but just take the ARM example when you take the CPU documentation the memory, the bus documentation for the buses which are in there, and the memory part, memory management, I guess you end up with 25,000 pages of documentation. Not for the safety part, just for the normal documentation. So you can make a lot of assumptions in this field. And that's what we try to help a little bit with um, different parts to just get an understanding of the system, where can you identify parts. So we, for the automotive, we had a meter ELISA, which shows a example use case. For systems, we do this more on a wider scope with Xen and Zephyr. Uh, we show how to do system analysis with STPA. We use certain. We set up some tools for code analysis with Code Checker, for example. Had the upstream workload tracing. Uh, we had the RT Linux, which I mentioned. So, and where is the underline there? You can uh, basically click on on the slides and get to the documentation and links on this. And so all, all work groups then end up in uh, documentation with GitHub, G Drive blogs, white paper, we have a seminar series, so the upcoming seminar soon on the Rust certified compiler. We are trying to get something also on code coverage coming up more in the May time frame. So if you subscribe to the lists, you will all get this information or if you follow us on social. Uh, yeah, with the reference system, uh, this is like how an architecture looks like. And Stefano was giving the presentation before, actually two years back, he was going to Austin presenting his kind of architectural thoughts with the Dom Zero last approach, Dom Zero in there with Zephyr. He took this from a real industrial use case. And when we started this, there was a ongoing discussion in AGL, which had a similar architecture. We came up with this architecture. And I guess you may find your architectures as well in there where you say, okay, I have containers, I have virtualization, there's an artist involvement because the chips underneath just provide this functionality and you will make use of it. And here we try to get the things in and you see the icons 
of the different projects. And this was very important that we not take it alone, that we interact with others. Um, so we have a very strong communication with the Xen and Xafire people. We have the AGL part for interaction. We went to uh, Sophie also to discuss with them about the cloud SDV arc environment and also with Eclipse Foundation. We had, for example, an organized panel for open source and safety at some Exedia events last year. And yeah, with Yoke to SPDX, I mean, it's quite clear. So the SPDX part was also for a safety profile. We created uh, the SPDX safety interest group from ELISA, but we said it's not the right place to talk about ASPOMs alone in ELISA. We need it. But the right place to talk about safety in ASPOMs is with the SPDX people. So that's why we have a special interest group there. The group meets Friday also late. So for me, I, for me it's too late, it's like six on Friday. And I don't like to work at this time, but uh, the people are very in there are very committed and the, for getting the US people in, it's also more in the late evening European time, right? And it's really all about, right, not sharing apples, but sharing ideas, because if you share the apple, you still have one apple or hand over the apple. And, but if you share an idea, you end up have two ideas. So that's the nice thing. And this is important for all the challenges which we have. Uh, Right, this is OSS, as you all know, it doesn't behave like commercial software. This has benefits and drawbacks. Maybe we can take this in the discussion. What does it mean? Like having influence or having not influence on the people contributing. How does it stand for a commercial environment? Why were certain rules created in the standards? And uh, also like the training part. If you look in the ISO, it says you should be trained. How do you figure out that the training is sufficient. Can you really say this person is qualified or not? And will you ever go to uh, Greg Crow Hartman and tell him, can you show me your C certificate that you have done some C certification or I cannot trust your patches anymore? I mean, that's something that you need to keep in mind. Then even if you go for this and say, oh, I trust, I know that this person is doing work for years. So this person could get, uh, sorry, maintainer rights, for example, or committer rights. Well, we had just the XZ case, which was mentioned out in the keynotes, where it's social engineering. So you have a person where you start trusting, how does this work for safety system? And this is something the ISO standard, for example, doesn't cover because it comes from a commercial environment where they never considered such a case. And also in a commercial environment, I know a few management people doing kind of uh, coming from a T1, going to an OEM, and two years back, Two years later, they're coming back to the tier one. So they got all the insights, right? So this is something also like an intrusion part. So these are elements which you can keep in mind for your safety part. What about if some person goes from one company to the other, you claim him as a safety expert, but he's still bound with the other company and suddenly starts to uh, put in something harmful in there. How do you review things get in? So these are all elements. Uh, the pre-last point I really like is the liability of a community because a lot of people buy also commercial software because they would get away of liability. And the community typically is not liable for this. So it's, we don't come with a liability clause or so, so you are getting responsible. And I find this quite interesting to be considered that you as a company don't want to take the liability to certain parts of your product and you better give it to someone else who is willing to give this liability. And uh, what does this imply? Does it mean you don't trust your own projects? Does it, does it mean you do not trust your own competencies? And this said, I was talking to developers uh, where I said, oh, this sounds great. Would you be willing to commit this in an open? And then they came out and said, well, you know, I'm not feeling too confident. I have the feeling it's not good enough for the open source. I said, well, why, how can it be not good enough for open source? Because they had the expression like it's getting exposed, right? Other people look at it, they see, and if you don't feel comfortable and like everybody can see my code, am I really good enough in coding? And then it will become, but it's good enough to create products for your company, right? This is like the same argumentation where they say, is open source quality really higher or lower? Or can I take the risk? What does it mean if I go open source? It's all a world of hobbyists, which is, we know it's not. Uh, but this is the argumentation, which you also have the safety argumentation. And taking this all in, uh, I conclude with my 
last slide as soon as it wants to change again. Here we go. Uh, yeah, all the mentioned projects which we have in there, they are there with a just show up policy. So you can just go there. You can start asking questions. You can bring in use cases, ideas. Uh, we form domain specific working groups where have special focus topics or we do some like task force teams which just go through topic ramp them down again. You can share best practices because this is all in the idea of safety. And if we are creating safety systems or just give guidelines, documents and so on in the open, this can become a best practice. And actually these ISO standards which you have or IC standards, they are there as best practice, state of the art development. So if you go to court and, assume, and get sued and you have a law case, they typically look under these, have you followed certain guidelines? Are you doing state of the art? If we in the open show better practices than a product would do, let's say you're doing all your Linux, Sapphire things or, or normal artist part on your own inside your company in a closed environment and someone figures out later on at the, at the case at court, you know, you haven't followed this these guys were using an STPA analysis and with the system theoretic process analysis, you would have found out that your architecture was wrong because they had a similar case and showed it already. Then you were not doing state of the art technology and then it doesn't help that you have certified because in the open there's enough material available which shows you that the standard is not enough to do. So these are the things why to discuss more in the open for the better, for the safety of the people and the products. So let's tackle the challenge together and we can enter into discussions, I guess. Just to have mentioned, I have all the links and entry points to the different projects at the back. So uh, you could just download the slides and now we can have a discussion. I have Anyone wants to kick off? Obvious question is, is there a roadmap for the next year or something? I mean, particular goals for the project or is it just being driven by what volunteers are willing to contribute? Um, yeah, regarding roadmap, it's basically what's brought in. We have, for example, the June workshop where we also set up uh, one, one topic where it says what the roadmap of our members, what are really pressing points where we should focus on. But there are some parts which we definitely can say, so we're scaling currently with the basal tooling. So there's later the talk from Luigi uh, saying about it. So we set it up, we want to f bring it to life so that people can really use uh, requirements tooling for focused on Linux part. This is in there. Uh, we are currently creating a roadmap on the Linux features again, where to go next, where to look first. I forgot what we wanted to touch at the first topic. Uh, I need to check in the slides from Alessandro. I don't know what he had. Gap, if you remember what was the first one, I don't know. But we have we start getting there and a little bit of agenda. What are the features which we are looking at? And so we have little minor steps. The documentation on a proper like you go there on a wiki or a GitHub or so and just see what the roadmap is. This is not directly visible as such. So uh, it could be that we end up as a workshop in June again for the next year's roadmap part and then uh, make a blog post out of it so that you have a track record of it. Yeah, the other part which we are looking in is to try to get a proper use case for our system. We have the example system, we've just showed it at Embedded World that it's there and it was a very boring system. So I, I showed it to my manager, they wanted to see it and it, I had this case and I opened it and I said it booted, you could see a command and I said, here, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Where are the things? I said, here you are. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I can start another guest. See, here's another guest VM. Yeah. So really? like, it was nothing for a management, right? And I said, oh, I, I also have here, we share an Ethernet device. Eh? What's the use case behind it? And this is where we will look into, like, how can we get a use case? Who's willing to share design documents, architectures, or just bring in the commitment to say, I also drive a certain use case forward. We were considering, for example, the electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, there's the LF Everest project where they have safety critical parts which they typically do on their own on microcontrollers or so, so that it's not in there. And they have a lot of QM parts, but we say you can also put some safety responsibility in this charging infrastructure where they also have real time 
regulation. So we say we put certain things on Xen, we give a little bit of responsibility to Linux. We also, for example, evaluate what does it mean when your QM system really interacts heavily with your artists. So you have the artists which need to fulfill part, but you may want to get information from the artists on uh, charging parts, how long will it take, and some sensor data. What does it mean? What is when an attack comes? Is the system still safe? And these kind of things we try to get as first use case idea, but we need also the people who commit to it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Philip, um, I want to add on top. I mean, yes, I mean, what Philip explained is, uh, you know, the technical roadmap, you know, in terms of activities that we have, that we have planned today. Um, I want to chime in also from um, in terms of how is this roadmap defined and we have strategic goals that are defined by the governing board that you know where basically premium members are you know those that can drive you know and define these strategic goals and the strategic goals are then you know digested basically by the technical steering committee and are translated into a, a technical roadmap so just you know to yeah, to give um, a bit more you know explanation exactly. on the process yeah and this goes also on wider things and also uh i mean this is something where we also discussed for roadmap topics so say well, how will we generate new input how will we get these parts so our workshop in lund for example is also it's considered for members but it's open for non-members so if you're bringing a good topic if you would like to get into a discussion if you have a proposal on this uh, we're quite set already with the agenda but uh, these kind of things can also get in. You say, well, I'm interested, but where are, what I can also say, if you just go there and say, I'm interested, but I have nothing to share, you need to be a very attractive company I, that I say, okay, yeah, that's the point to get in because um, these projects, you see it and you know it most likely if you're working in them, there are many, many members, but it's also a bunch which basically follows. I have this in the automotive industry specifically, that's where I come from. I, know so many people will say we become member that's an important initiative go there and follow what's going on and then you have 20 people in the room and 60 uh, 16 of them are actively following what the four people say and then it looks like there are 20 people and four people working and then things become quite inefficient there would be much more if there's more commitment in there and there we are fully open so also to bring in topics to lead work groups to drive forward so our Linux feature workgroup is led by Red Hat now, but there's a co-lead who is just an individual. So he's not from a company or so. He just showed interest, brought the right capabilities, and uh, therefore he became the co-host of the Linux features workgroup. And that's also how we approach things, quite open and active. more points some related industry someone from medical with a good use case this would be something which is still of interest so we had i say that we I, it didn't touch medical but we had um the open aps system which is i, I touched it actually with the workload tracing but there was the open artificial pancreas system to have a glucose monitor and insulin pump which was an open source project created in the open without any certification or so just by the de needs and demands of the people with diabetes and they said they, we need to have something and it was by Dana M. Lewis she didn't wake up at night from the warning so her family was warned that her glucose monitor was going and someone else had to stand up and she was annoyed by these kind of things so what she, what she did was that she put a Raspberry Pi to her glucose monitor and, and controls her insulin pump and the ELISA project took this use case and did safety analysis look what are the parts in the system what does it mean how do we operate, what subsystems are called from the Linux kernel, what are the syscalls which are done, and this was quite brought to an end, but we also said it would be nice to get this kind of example more from a real medical, not that the other thing is not real, but from an industry case to also better understand the medical demands. So this would be a topic which is, for example, of interest to us. Or we mainly covered IEC 615.08 parts, ISO 262, the aerospace part, we don't have the industry, industrial standard. There are also industrial safety standards that are very interesting, like for operation of machines. If there is an expert on this and can share ideas, I think this is also something which is very valuable for the laser activities. Hi. 
Hello, Philip. Hey. So <clears throat> I'm wondering, the, there are a lot of other group, working groups uh, re regarding to SDV, SOA, all those are, they are, they are uh, growing, they pops out. So for example, like Eclipse, there is a working group inside, inside Eclipse, uh, which is uh, sp specific targeting SDV. Yeah. And uh, I'm wondering, is there any collaboration between yeah. ELISA with Eclipse? And other work, other open source uh, project. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's actually. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I have have Google it. The first thing pops out is your your proposal, which is declined by Eclipse Kong in last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I give a statement to the decline proposal first. Even contributor from Eclipse Con, which so from Eclipse ecosystem were declined there so that was very funny i was talking to the one of the eclipse sdv person and say oh you know you didn't want to have me and she said they also didn't want to have me and this was quite surprising so she was contributing to the eclipse sdv in the ecosystem for the sdv track but they didn't find a spot for it. that's the one part uh, we also said we need to align better because i sent an invitation to the sdv workgroup lead to say come to our workshop in lund I said, oh yeah, this sounds great. By the way, I also wanted to invite you to our community day to, in, to our, uh, I think it's Friedrichshafen, I'm not sure where, uh, somewhere in the south of Germany. Oh yeah, that's great. When are you planning this? The 4th and 5th of June. Oh yeah, we're doing the same. Uh, damn it. Right? We are completely had an overlap. Last year in October, we had this, we had the workshop in Munich. We invited the SDV people, but they had the eclipse gone in parallel, so they couldn't just come. But we find a way around, and we met just after EclipseCon and after our workshop at Spitzingsee at the Exeter Symposium and had an open source automotive panel there. So we were doing a joint activity and we will increase this. So I'm, I started discussion that the Eclipse SDV group, they look on how to work with libraries, components, how what to do from an open source component perspective to certify, to do testing, what are the processes needed for it. Things we are Xen, Zephyr, Elisa discussed since years for much harder topic than a single library. And so we will continue this discussion and bring a closer collaboration to this. And um, I also would say through the Eclipse SDV, the collaboration is closer and stronger compared to Sophie. So for Sophie, we touched, we were also been in discussion, but we haven't so close relationship because, uh, I don't know, basically maybe it's from the ecosystem because it's good from the time and perspective and all these kind of things. Yeah. Okay. So the question following is, uh, uh, so you guys are working on the kernel side, but there are a lot of other yeah, r relatively small project. They, work, they might be working on something like a, a communication bus or, uh, or a specific application, something like that. Yeah. But how, uh, how would they to uh, interact with Elisa? And uh, so to what extent you can give a suggestion to those uh, project? Because uh, 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 I see that uh, the, the safety and the security issue is really matters while you start designing your own project and you need yeah. to consider your the, the, like lo those uh, tips from Elisa, yeah. yeah. I you said was we from Elisa look on into the kernel and we have a strong kernel focus. That's right. But we also mainly concentrate on the kernel side because that's where we can spend our resources and engineers which we have. Our member companies, of course, look into a much wider scope. They look into the related libraries, they look into open source components, and this is exactly what uh, SUSE Canonical, Red Hat, CodeThink, Electrobit, Wind River, what they all do they look into the wider system and they bring in these parts. So they also say, here is a certain commitment, here are parts. Um, what we still try to also bring forward is to ramp up the collaboration with the CIP project again. So that's one Gab was talking about strategic goals and we said one of the strategic goals for the roadmap is to get in touch again with CIP project, Civil Infrastructure Platform, because they run an industries environment with long-term support they made ideas up on how do I configure the kernel? What are my essential packages which I need? So they have a set of 10 core packages, a high extended set of 500 packages. And if you start from a standard Linux system, 
you will not talk about 100 packages, right? You will talk in the thousands packages. If you download your uh, Linux flavor of choice, I I like, I think it's for, for the Red Hat case, I thought the numbers, there's like 25,000 packages in Fedora, I guess. Then it's 5,000 packages for Red Hat Enterprise Linux and 500 packages for the automotive side of it, which shows you you break it down. And if you have ever built an automotive project, you know that you will get down to 100 sets of packages and libraries. And when you build up a use case, that's also fitting to what you say, uh, we were looking into the complete parse from showing graphics, having capturing maybe with uh, V4L2, and these, so we go through the stack of the elements. But the main focus, yes, is still on the Linux kernel side because that's where we have a common set across use cases, across companies. So it's basically where it is, and then it's the capacity limit of the project size which we have. Yeah, good. We can have one or two more last questions because it's break time, and I don't want to keep anyone away from break, so therefore uh, <laughs> just said, let's take one or two more. We're officially at the end. Uh, my question is, how do you deal with testing and documentation mostly in open source and safety? Like when you have a new patch, because the idea is to continue improving, when you have a new patch, do you force the person doing the patch to create the specification of the patch and the testing and the documentation? So or this how is, do you deal with yeah, that? This will not work most likely. So um, we hope that we can address this also in Vienna this year better in Plumbers. How we, so um, it starts also maybe in other parts where you just improve starting with man pages also and identify what are safety related, non-safety related part of your kernels. As you first of all, from the whole patch set that you identify what are critical patches and then see how do we can with a limited or no impact start getting traceability and see where are the things, are there regressions, what are the testing results. That's why we have as PDX as bombs involved while we do certain, I mean, what we just show is just limited testing. We just basically have a QA pipeline with one or two tests at the end to just get the pipeline flow through. But um, yeah, this is, I guess, also one of how good you deal with handling the patch set, this will be a differentiating factor. And um, what we discuss in basics and like it's how it could look like, but we haven't brought this also in the full ELISA flow yet. And uh, we also rely on what the member companies do if they all come together and say, let's bring this as a new topic. Uh, that's a point, but they do exactly what you say. They check each patch and see how things go, what is related, what not. Can I just do the update? Do I need to do the update? Do I need the patch? And this is what makes it expensive and costs time, and therefore they work yeah, more close to automate and make it more efficient. If every company is doing the exact same work, it's just it yeah, that, the point of open source. Yeah, uh, that's, and I guess it's, it will be a process, I guess. Okay. It will get more centralized and you figure out, I mean, that's what you also, that's why you have distributions. That's why you don't build your own system, why you have CV ending, why you bring it things to maintainers and so on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hey, thanks. Last question. So I notice Boeing is a premier member of the ELISA and it's a company that's kind of under the microscope for safety and uh, <laughs> critical systems. However, there's not too many major name or major companies in aerospace. And so having the code kept within the company is a pretty easy thing to have within some aerospace companies. How much of the community is able to collaborate, review with those uh, major players, specifically like Boeing as a ELISA member? Yeah. So, I mean, Boeing just, they opened the, they started the work group, they have the aerospace work group, and they were really looking and they, they say, we're open to everything which flies. That was one point, they said, that's not all where the safety standards for Boeing are exactly to be taken, but they say, you can, we can also have smaller flights, we can have drones or things which go potentially into space, even if they don't have, so they are opening this. Uh, and they were really like saying, okay, we have certain challenges. We see that we would like to make wider use of Linux system, maybe in the cabin part or non-cabin things that 
I was mixed up with what, but from like where you can do parts, how you can increase the safety levels, and then for example, Wind River, who is in there, they are also doing a lot of work for avionics and aerospace. So actually, this week there is Olivier, and he gives a presentation talking about Elisa and the activities Wind River are doing on an aerospace conference. So that's where they collaborate and where. And Steve, who leads the aerospace work group, and I were in close alignment with Olivier to see that we are talking about the same thing, that it matches the parts, so there are collaborations possible. And uh, it's really also that here I've been in discussion with a research institute which works closely with Airbus, and we will also have follow-ups. Maybe they come to the Lund workshop to also bring in their thoughts because they share their ideas, what they're doing, and they're so close to what also Boeing does. So they have, they, they are telling the same problems and they don't want to have this differentiating part with so, well, I manage to maintain packages. That's not differentiating, it's a must have. You cannot sell this to the customer. Maybe if you're alone or so, if you build your, but it's not also not a selling point for it. May, it doesn't make your aircraft cheaper than you when you do all the things on your own. And that's why they would like to collaborate. Oh yeah, Chuck, I didn't see you. I was looking for you at this side. So otherwise I would have said Chuck answer the question. <laughs> I work for Boeing. I'm doing a presentation here later, um, and I'm on the Aerospace Working Group Committee. Uh, Steve Vanderlees runs it. He's, a, he's really good, way better than I. I've learned a ton. <clears throat> I think you're asking, like, are we developing out in the open so the world can, like, see for themselves? And to a certain degree, we are, okay? We're using Yocto. That's not a secret thing. Um, I gave a presentation on it at OSSNA last year. Uh, I'm going to do another one on safety-critical stuff this year. It won't be on Yocto, but... Um, trying to introduce some new things in the lexicon. So there's always going to be proprietary elements. Obviously, we can't disclose because we're a profit-making entity just like anything else. We need an incentive to, to live. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean we're not subject to a lot of regulatory forces that force our nose to the grindstone to produce other artifacts. From a professionalized development environment like you can imagine Google has, we have to take that a step further. And there are systemic uh, processes and things we do. You can squint and see those in every other safety critical discipline. Um, there's a foundational element that you see coming out of, of what, there's a foundational element in what Boeing does and what is flying that you see coming out in Alyssa and, and hopefully as the years progress more contributions to the Yocto project. So you'll see those things occur out in the open going forward. These were nice closing words. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Chuck. So we finish here. <laughs>